All right, uh, thank you. We are delighted uh, to have members of the JCT staff here, as well as the director of the JCT, Tom Barthold. Uh, but in any case, we're gonna, we're gonna hear from uh, Pam uh, Muma and Nick Bull on uh, how, what is that Tom Hanks movie? How you do that thing you do or something? <laughs> Uh, anyway, I'm not sure who's speaking first, but Pam and Nick are going to set, Pam's speaking first uh, for 15 minutes, and then Nick will speak for 15 minutes. So uh, without further ado, let me introduce Pam. Okay, well, uh, thank you all for coming out in this awful weather. I was a little worried, uh, or it just occurred to me at the last minute that I didn't have a joke to start with, but then uh, Len put me in mind of an old oldie but goodie. Um, what, what would happen if all the economists and all the weather forecasters switched places? Nothing. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I think that's why we're kind of the, um, the philosophy that appears to be underlying a lot of the questions that are going on here today. Um, what Nick and I are going to do, and this goes to David's introduction, is we're not going to talk about the same things that we usually talk about, because we've all heard it a million times. Um, I'm going to be providing some, some history to remind people of where we are in terms of uh, modeling and modeling research. And then Nick is going to provide a lot of um, information about the detail that goes into characterizing policies. And we are going to talk about those two rules and what the differences are between them. So uh, with respect to the discussion that just happened, that will happen at the end when Nick talks about it. So just a reminder, a model is a very simplified view of the world. And I, that's what, where a lot of the concern comes from. The modeler has to make choices about what aspects of the economy they need to make sure to model carefully and what aspects they can simplify away from because no model can, can solve if you're going to try to include everything about the economy. So JCT started working on deciding about modeling, um, on, on deciding what type of models to use with this symposium, and there are people in the room, people on the panel that were part of the symposium. Um, in 1996, and you can find that pamphlet on our website to get. I still think it kind of sets the table for all the discussion that came later, so if you want to get really in the weeds, read the pamphlet. Uh, what that symposium did was it invited nine groups of modelers to analyze the same sets of proposals and to the extent possible analyze the same sets of proposals assuming the same things about the current law economy. Uh, we had three overlapping generation models, three infinitely live agent models, and three macroeconometric models. And the policies that we asked them to analyze, this was driven by what was the interest in tax reform at the time, consumption-based reform. So we had a unified income tax. Some people think of it as corporate integration. And we had a VAT tax. And then we had variations on them with various transition relief. And these are just things from the pamphlet. I don't expect you to absorb them completely. But we had a whole big range of results. We also so tried to summarize parameters that went into the different models. And the takeaway we had from these was there was a huge difference between the results of the models, even though they were, in theory, analyzing the same proposal, and in theory, starting with the same starting assumption about the economy. So in the short run, in the VAT, it was predicted that GDP would decrease by 4.2%, all the way up to increasing by 16.4%. Um, a lot of the models were more geared to longer run analysis, so when the ones that could produce long run kind of settled down to a narrower range, uh, 1.7 to 7.5%. So kind of going back to thinking about uh, the concern about camp macro, which the results range between 0.6 and 1.5, we've come kind of a long way. <laughs> um, and not all the models, as I said, could model uh, 
the short run. Also, not all the models can model the long run. And the thing about the other slide on the parameters, there was less variation in parameters between models than there was in the GDP results. So what did we take from that going forward for developing our models? Well, modeling framework, meaning is it an, OL, an overlapping generations model, is it an econometric model, matters. The choice of parameters, the choice of how sensitive you assume labor and capital and various other things are to the tax matters. Um, some models model monetary policy, that matters. It was a big deal in the consumption tax. And this was more of a surprise. I think academicians knew all those other things. Characterization of present law matters. A lot of, we discovered the, this symposium met for like three or four meetings before their final results, and the, the results were more broadly skewed in the early meetings than they were in the end. And part of that was because of everybody not even having the under, same understanding of what present law is. And the details of the proposal matter. Some modelers were very uh, surprised to find that when they put transition relief in, the results changed a lot. So after that initial uh, bit of learning that we did, we, the JCT staff went out and selected a couple models to work with. And then we started working with them and presenting analyses that we did with them to a lot of different groups. Um, the criteria that we ended up with for our models was that they should reflect, first of all, to the extent possible, the state of the art of macro modeling in the academic literature. Um, however, we had to take into account several practical considerations. First, there are time constraints for producing estimates. So the real state of the art in the economic literature then and in, even today is very fancy computable generation computable general equilibrium models. And the fancier they are, particularly if they have some kind of uh, stochastic or chance element, the longer they take to solve. So there, the models that are like the, the technical wizards have out there today and, and earlier ones had back then would take two weeks to run through one simulation. Obviously when, you know, and then if you get weird results, then you have to go back and start over for another two weeks before you even get your first result. So, we can't quite be at the, at the cutting edge because we, we don't have that kind of time. Um, we also wanted to be able to produce a range of results because there is this divergence in the literature. So we had several models. And most importantly, given where we are, we need to be able to uh, make sure we have the tax sector characterized correctly. So I emphasize that again. Models should have as much tax detail as possible. Academic models don't tend to. So let's talk about the house rule that we've been operating under uh, since 2003. It's required that we provide a macroeconomic analysis of the effects of uh, the proposal on uh, GDP, labor, capital, and revenues, basically, of any bill that comes up that is reported by the Ways and Means Committee to the House floor. Uh, and so we've done that. Now, as it turns out, the vast majority of bills that get reported out of the Ways and Means Committee to the House floor are very small. They're so small that showing GDP effects within reasonable rounding, you get zero. So for those bills, we have a statement that says the results are too small to report. Now, there have been other proposals that we suspect would have a measurable effect, but our models haven't been configured to take them into account. For example, um, there have been some models that had a lot of attempts to reform international tax flows. In those cases, we write a qualitative analysis, informed to the best we can with our models, but uh, we don't, since our models, we don't think, and or we don't think the academic literature has enough uh, research to tell us quantities. We don't try to give quantities. And then finally, we have full-scale bills. So currently, the models that we use for our macroanalysis are something we call a structural macroequilibrium, macroeconomic equilibrium growth model, which we refer to as MEG, an overlapping generations model, 
we refer to as OLG, and we've been working on and off with a dynamic stochastic general equilibrium model, DSGE. And you can see descriptions of these models on our website. <clears throat> we have a tab or a link to macroeconomic documents. Um, the models that we used to analyze Representative Camp's Tax Reform Act of 2014 were the MEG model and the OLG model. So I'm going to tell you a little more about that. They both have basic neoclassical foundations with the mainstream that comes from the mainstream of economic literature. Um, consumption follows a life cycle pattern. Labor supply responds to marginal and average changes in after-tax wages. Saving and consumption respond to after-tax return savings and after-tax income. Business investment responds to the expected return on investment and to something called the after-tax cost of capital, which is um, taking taxation of capital into account. And that, in part, depends on, depends on the availability of savings. Uh, both models do have cross-border capital flows uh, so that net exports affect the domestic economy. There are exchange rate equations in them. So let's talk about the difference between the two models. In the MEG model, we do have, in the long run, equilibrium demand adjusts to hit supply. But in the short run, we can allow for unemployment. And that turned out to be very pop, um, important because we've had to analyze bills that were short run demand stimulus bills. Our behavioral equations are structural, meaning we use elasticities that come from empirical measurements. We divide our labor supply into four categories, high and low primary earners, high and low secondary earners. The purpose of this is they tend to have different amounts of responsiveness to tax changes, and often different proposals affect them differently. And we, one of the things we discovered with all our experimentation is when you separate that out, you can get a very different answer relative to if you just use one tax rate. Um, the other key thing about the MEG model is that people are myopic, meaning they know what the economy looks like today when they're making their decisions. They don't know what it's going to look like 10 years from now. Now, what this does is it enables us to model policy changes that have a growing deficit. So the discussion we had before about, well, what do you do about assuming the debt? F fortunately, in this model, we don't have to assume it. One thing it can tell us, because it does solve out to the future, is where the economy blows up. And that's a piece of information as well. In contrast, our OLG model is more kind of coming directly from the, uh, what's going on in academic departments. So it's constructed on microeconomic foundations. It uses deep parameters. Um, supply always has to equal demand. It models instead of income groups, age cohorts. And the people in the model have perfect foresight. So they can look today and see a huge deficit in the future. And this is what you're always hearing about these models. There's no rational thing for them to do, so they don't, and the model doesn't solve. And that's why there is a lot of discussion about needing some kind of fiscal closing assumption. So uh, recently, we've also added a specific multinational corporation sector in the OLG model. Actually, we, we leased this from someone who's been working with that. And the good thing about that is it gives us a better handle on those uh, proposals that are designed to affect that. Ongoing model development. We work all the time to keep up with the literature, do the best we can to reflect changes. Um, right now, we're double checking the, some of the parameters in the OLG multinational sector. We're doing our own econometric work, see what we think of that. And we're still building in-house, our own in-house OLG model and a DSGE model. So um, the rest of the presentation is going to tell you why the development of your macro model is only half the story. Because getting both present law tax and the tax policy right is a lot more complicated than anyone who hasn't tried to do it in the detail that we have to do it at JCT for our conventional estimates can understand. And we're going to use the camp reform package. 
So I'm showing you here a couple pages from my revenue table. <coughs> Goes on for 15 pages. Every one of those items, we have to decide how to add together to put into our model. There are all these items because there are a lot of different deductions and credits, and we have to decide how to treat each one. And that is what Nick is going to talk about. we were already on the right page. Okay, so many people talk about dynamic analysis as though it's something that's impossible to do. Uh, note I'm talking about dynamic analysis, not dynamic scoring. So dynamic analysis is what we've been doing for a decade. And you can argue about whether you like the results that we have or not. But we think that what we've been doing is fairly reasonable, um, although we don't think we're perfect and we welcome comments and discussion. Um, Many others talk about dynamic analysis as though it's a magical thing. You just press a button. You could use this as a um, you know, real-time advice about somebody's proposed amendments. Well, it doesn't work that way. Um, but one speculative guess as to why people think it does is because of an ex it's an example of Clark's law. Clark is Arthur C. Clark of 2001 A Space Odyssey. And his law says any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. Well, w what we're hoping is that after a few minutes of looking at um, inside the hat, you'll realize there is no magic button. It's hard work, and um, that's what we do. So Pam's talked about so a little bit about you know, initializing models to you know, choosing models, initializing them to parameter values consistent with the economic literature, et cetera. Uh, we had a paper almost a decade ago where we looked at um, what is the impact of putting in really simple tax assumptions, like one average tax rate for the whole economy, or just an average and just a marginal, or breaking it into um, components that address different aspects of income. And we found that it's really important to, to get it right for multiple sources of income. So. In particular, for individuals, we compute average and marginal tax rate for wage and salaries in total, and for the labor supply groups that Pam mentioned, high and low, primary and secondary. Um, we compute average and marginal for interest, dividends, capital gains, business income on individual returns, so that's Schedule C, E, and F, um, and then other. For corporations, we compute average and marginal tax rates um, if you ask our corporate estimator what's the average rate or the marginal rate, you spend two or three hours in a discussion about what that is. Um, then we combine the individual pass-through rates and the corporate rate to get a weighted average business rate that gets fed into the macro models. And finally, both the main models that we work with, OLG and MEG, um, handle depreciation separately, so we talk with the conventional estimator about present value effects, liability effects, and then you have to back out of those. What's the implied change in capital consumption allowances consistent with the way that the model's set up? Okay, so Pam showed you a little bit of the 15 pages of um, the camp table. This is just picking one provision almost at random. Uh, it's the domestic production deduction, and the columns are ITM, IM, BM. Um, so ITM is, if this provision is on the individual tax model, then you, you'd have a, an indicator there. Individual marginal, IM. Um, domestic production deduction obviously has an individual effect through pass-through income that's reported on individual returns. Similarly, it has a corporate effect. So that one's sort of obvious. Um, for each provision, you know, the, there are four macro estimators and 15 or so conventional estimators. So we can't know the details of every, every possible provision. So what I or somebody else ends up doing is walking around the floor and talking with the estimators about any provisions that are significant enough in terms of their score that you really want to find out how does this provision work and what's it doing. For a lot of provisions, um, it's obvious whether it has just average effects or some marginal effect. 
But for other provisions like um, last in, first out method of inventory, it gets more complicated. It, that has large um, average effects, but also um, it has marginal effects. And you can sort of take a look at the slide and think about it a little bit more later. So at this stage, we have a good idea about the details of the proposal, ideally. Um, and then the question is, can the existing models handle those details, or do we need to figure out how we can modify the model so that it will handle it correctly? So for instance, the first time that we modeled repeal of the home mortgage interest deduction in MEG, we had to go and tweak the, the cost of capital equations a little bit to, to make sure we were modeling that correctly. Now some provisions, you might just decide you're, you can't model it anything, in any reasonable way, and, and then you're sort of stuck. But you can't have, you can't make models that can handle every possible um, strange thing that people come up with. Okay, so for provisions that are modeled using the individual tax model, uh, we need to compute the effect on average and marginal rates by source of income. And so we have an ATR, MTR calculator that's about 3,000 lines of code, and that modifies the existing roughly 52,000 lines that represent the individual model, which is a model that you, know, you can put in a proposal and find out how that changes liability. Um, for marginal tax rates by income source, you have roughly 40 iterations for each year because you've got nine sources of income. You need to figure out the marginal rate in the present law, that's a couple iterations. You need to figure it out in proposed law, that's another couple iterations. Um, and then for each iteration, you have to make sure that you're not leaving accidentally effects, you know, when you're incrementing income, you haven't left that increment embedded in the, the data. So you have to back that out again. Um, it's important for proposals that include base broadening that the average and effective marginal rates are calculated with respect to a broad base rather than something that's narrow so that we can represent both the present law and the proposal. Um, seemingly simple changes can be unexpectedly difficult to debug. So in particular, something that bedeviled us for a while was the switch from uh, current law where capital gains are taxed at a separate rate to the proposal to exclude a portion of capital gains but tax all of what, what remains at an ordinary rate that's, that's in camp. Um, it seems like it should be easy, but it takes a while to get that right. Um, even having got all of this right, some people uh, would argue, Jane I think will bring up a point in a few minutes, that we haven't quite got it right. Um, we have done a little bit of experimentation um, to, to check to see quantitatively is Jane's critique um, really significant or something that for the purpose of trying to get things done um, we can ignore as a rounding error. And in at least the sort of preliminary experiments, and, and maybe we haven't fully grasped what you're saying, um, what we've looked at sort of suggests it's down into the rounding error. So this is the, that's, now we've got the individual tax model um, after tax, the ATR and MTR effects. We have to look at the rest of the provision. So I think we've taken care of maybe one or one and a half pages out of the 15, the provisions that are on the ITM. Um, the rest are not on the ITM and you have to figure out the average or marginal rate effects. So assuming that you've got all that, the next step is to run macro models. So pick a macro model, you're gonna compute the current law macroeconomic baseline. You need to read in a proposed law change. And then a step that I think many people sort of don't think about and um, are not aware that of its importance is checking to see, does the liability change that you're getting at this stage before, we're not even talking about running the macro effects of the policy, just calculating something that roughly corresponds to a conventional score, and then checking to see, do the macro models produce the same conventional score that the 15 pages of table um, show? And if it doesn't, then you've got to do some debugging. 
Um, typically, that means iterating back and forth between the individual tax model, spreadsheet inputs, and the macro model until you've got the conventional estimate matching. So now, if you're convinced that the conventional estimate is being correctly computed, you start working on running alternate macro runs. And the first question that we ask ourselves when we look at those is, does the um, macro effect on the revenue estimate correspond roughly with the macro effect on big aggregates like GDP, consumption, labor supply? D does it make sense in that context? Um, and then we look at the changes in the macro aggregates for the different models, and we think about whether those are behaving in a way that's consistent with what we and most people understand about how those models work. Um, ultimately, sometimes we find there are aspects that we're, we don't understand, and, and so we'll go back and, and um, perform debugging runs. So often that consists of doing stacking series. So you look at just the effects of the individual tax model average and marginal rate changes, just the effect of the off-model pieces, just the effect of depreciation, and then you start putting them together and, and you're trying to understand, have you modeled this correctly or is there a step at which you've got some, some error in your inputs? Um, and then typically we do sensitivity runs. So we look at the effects of different monetary policy assumptions for models that can, can handle that. We look at the effects of different labor supply elasticities, uh, different marginal propensity to consume, et cetera. But meanwhile, um, while one person has implemented this in one of the models, somebody else has been implementing it in the other models, and you're gonna consolidate results into a spreadsheet. I don't mean you're gonna to add together the results or take a weighted average. You're just looking at the results all in one place so you can compare them between the models. And you're trying to figure out whether what you're looking at makes sense in the context of what you know about these models. Um, meanwhile, by this time, someone's typically written the shell of a report, so they're They've provided background on the proposal, described it in detail, talked about its effect on tax rates. Um, sometimes those get put in earlier on and you discover errors, so you have to go back and fix them. Uh, but as macro results become available, then you're putting those into the report and that gives another stage at which people can think deeply about um, what these, you know, whether these results are consistent with the models uh, and whether they're consistent with the proposal. So we have lots of these reports already posted on the website, um, and this just sort of lists the, for the most recent five or six. Moving forward, there's the new house rule. So the new house rule, is, as was discussed before, um, has a sort of trigger for when you have to score something, um, but also something that wasn't, it was sort of pointed out that there's a need for it, but wasn't mentioned that it's already in the rule. The rule requires a qualitative analysis for the 20 years after the budget window. So if there are, if you have a proposal that is running, you know, causing huge deficits, then the, what happens outside the budget window is going to um, obviously not be the same as something that's a revenue neutral proposal that's not only revenue neutral inside the horizon, but after. Um, and what we are going to say in the qualitative analysis is still um, not certain. So moving forward, uh, you know, we've done dynamic analysis for a long time. Dynamic scoring is not something that we've done so far. So that's going to be a, a new challenge. I think there was one other thing I was going to say, but I can't remember what it is. So I'm going to finish up there. Um, I think that we're planning at this stage to move right on to the five minutes from several people on the panel, so that's Jane Gravel, and then questions that you have can come along um, afterwards. All right, thanks. I want to mention again uh, our, our thanks to JCC, JCT staff for coming here and presenting uh, the details of uh, the models. 
I have many reactions, one of which is, thank goodness, I don't have to do this. Uh, but we will talk about all of that and more. We have three discussants, uh, Jane Gravel from the Congressional Research Service, Alan Bayard from AEI, and uh, Chai Ching Huang from Center on Budget and Policy Priorities. So each of them will speak for five minutes, and then we'll all come up here and have a, a, a joint talk. Thanks. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm Jane Gravel from the Congressional Research Service. Um, and I want to say the views that I present here are not the views of the Congressional Research Service. Although there may be some similarity to papers that I've written for the Congressional Research Service. <laughs> so, and I also want to say to, uh, to our JCT folks here, I have a great admiration for the work you do. I know you are all dedicated public services. So I think if, I hope you take any questions I would raise about your analysis in the uh, context of helping to improve it. So, um, and this is really, I think there are a lot of lessons we could learn from the uh, dynamic analysis of the camp proposal, which is a very complicated proposal and, and had a lot of moving parts. Uh, the first is there is a big difference between individual rate cuts across the board and individual tax reform you know, very, the effects are very different. So for a tax cut, a really important issue is the short-run stimulus effect in the MAG model, in the JCT's in the House model. Uh, it's not allowed in the OLG model. And there are a lot of reasons, I think, for excluding this effect, including the offsetting actions of the Fed, but also the lack of dynamic scoring for appropriations. Now for revenue-neutral tax reform, stimulus effects are maybe less important. But it is important to incorporate base changes that are marginal in nature. And this is the question Nick referred to earlier. Uh, I, I don't think that was done in some circumstances, for example, the, the uh, deduction for state and local taxes. And I think it's important to find out if that is important. So I want to then talk about the reasons for the differences and the results in the, uh, in the camp simulation. So the top three lines of this graph show the MEG, in that's their in-house econometric model, uh, with high and low labor substitution elasticity and the OLG. These are without stimulus effects. And you see this enormous range of effects between the two models. Uh, you can also see the stimulus in the MEG is actually a little bigger than the supply side effects in the top. Why did that happen? Well, I think there are two major reasons. One is the labor supply effect in the OLG model is a lot bigger than in the, uh, than in the uh, MEG model. Uh, it can't, a little bit of it is because of the embedded uh, deep parameters I mentioned. You can turn into a labor s substitution elasticity, but it's only about 20% higher, while the labor supply change, change is 160% higher. Uh, there's a little bit of difference, possibly, from, from changes in capital, but it can't be imported. So I'm really not sure what happened there. What I suspect is that uh, the fiscal adjustments that need to be made in the OLG model to make it solve have probably washed out income effects from the labor, from the labor response. That's my guess, but I don't really know for sure. I just know they're different. Okay. The other reason is intangibles. If you can sort of do a back of the envelope calculation uh, of their results and see that the labor and capital, changes in labor and capital don't account for the total increase in output, uh, about 0.6% or about half of the difference between the two models uh, is, seems to be due to the shifting in intellectual property and treating it as an input into the production function, uh, sort of like physical capital. Now this has been done in a model by a couple of very respectable econ European economists, so it's not, it's not completely new, but it is kind of novel. Uh, and I think this is not the appropriate, an appropriate thing to include because intellectual capital is not located physically. Uh, once it exists, it can be used everywhere. When a firm discovers Lipitor, for example, that knowledge can be used, applied costlessly to production everywhere. So the fact that the patent moves to the United States instead of abroad doesn't change output because that effect is already there in output. 
So I think uh, that, that probably should be reconsidered in, in this uh, modeling. So I just want to sum up quickly what I, what I think the main points of what I'm saying here and the, and the things I suggest that JCT think about in the future. Uh, first, there's a, uh, there's a need for more transparency. Now, JCT apl already applies, supply, provides a lot of information, but not enough in this case for me to understand, and I've studied these models for a long time, why the results are the way they are. So I just have to speculate, and, and it's better not to have to do that. And I have to answer a lot of questions from my clients on this. So uh, second, for base broadening, it is important to account for changes in the shares of income that are taxed in measuring marginal effective tax weights. We believe those were significant. We, we have a CRS report that, that uh, looked at itemized deductions. Set third, should stimulus effects be included? I think there's a very strong case for excluding them. And finally, the OLG model is problematic, not just for the things that I've already mentioned, not only because of the element here, but in general, it depicts individual workers as perfectly informed and with perfect foresight. It can't measure our economy. So the question is, should it be continue to be used in contributing to a point estimate? Thank you. Thanks. I'm Alan Viard of the American Enterprise Institute. I first want to uh, thank uh, Brookings and the Tax Policy Center for organizing this really excellent conference. Uh, especially want to thank uh, Nick and Pam for the amazingly informative exposition on uh, what JCT has done and is doing, um, which I found uh, extremely insightful. I only have five minutes, so I'm going to just uh, make, I think, mainly comment about two features of the estimate of the CAMP bill. And I think each of them probably has some implications for evaluating the CAMP bill, but they also have implications for thinking about what dynamic analysis and dynamic scoring uh, can and should do. And of course, that will be my focus. So the first feature of the uh, JCT estimate of the CAMP bill, I think, is that the uh, re business tax reforms made in that bill do not uh, increase the capital stock or do so to a very slight extent. And again, there is that variation in estimates, but the majority of the estimates are actually negative that the uh, bill would have reduced the capital stock. I think that's uh, informative from the standpoint of economic policy. Uh, the in economic intuition behind it, I think, is relatively clear, um, and it uh, pertains to the nature of rate reduction offset by base broadening in the business tax context that the rate reduction benefits existing capital as well as new capital, while the brunt of the base broadening almost exclusively falls on new capital. And so that mixture tends to put an, increase the burdens on new investment. It gives a windfall to the existing capital, but we've already got it, so there's no incentive effects on that uh, score. And therefore, uh, we would expect that there probably there is a reduction in, uh, in capital, and the estimates uh, do show that. Uh, Marty Sullivan and, and Tax Notes, Brian Failer and Politico have, have written about this feature of the estimates. Now, I think it has some policy implications for whether you want to do that type of reform, although there's many other factors to consider. But I think what I want to just emphasize here for a moment is the implications for what we're going to get as we do more dynamic analysis or as we start to do dynamic scoring, which is you know, it's not it, we're going to see that different kinds of tax measures, different kinds of tax cuts, different kinds of tax increases actually do have different effects. And I think that's one of the important contributions that dynamic analysis can make. It's not to make all tax cuts look good or all tax increases look bad, but really its most valuable function is to sort out which types of tax cuts have the biggest effects on growth, which types of tax increases. And so things like taxes that apply to old capital and taxes that apply to new investment, you know, distinguishing those is really important. So then the other feature of the CAMP estimate that uh, drew my attention also pertains to the effects of rate reduction offset by base broadening, and that's the labor supply effect. Now, Jane has already talked about this uh, some, but uh, some of the estimates that uh, JCT uh, found in some of the models do show a what I would view as a very large labor supply effect, the 1.3 to 1.5 percent increase in the OLG model. Of course, uh, you know, as, as uh, we know, JCT did provide quite a lot of information about this estimate, but I think I would have to echo Jane's comment that in this case, it's, it's maybe not quite as much as is ultimately needed. The explanation that JCT put out says this proposal reduces effective marginal tax rates on labor, and I guess a, as a first cut, I wouldn't expect that to be the case because this is revenue neutral, distributionally neutral, rate cut, uh, base broadening combination. 
And with standard economic assumptions, you expect that to leave the effective marginal tax rate of labor roughly unchanged. Just a simple example, if you had an economy with a 40% statutory tax rate, people spent half their wages on apples and half on oranges, and apples were exempt and oranges were taxed. You could do a revenue neutral tax reform, lower the rate to 20% and tax both apples and oranges. So you would, of course, have obviously a dramatic cut in the statutory tax rate. Uh, but of course, the effective tax rate, uh, the effective trade-off at the margin between leisure and consumption would still be 20%. And so you would affect, expect a zero labor supply effect. Now, many reasons why the effect would not be exactly zero. There's what economists call non-severabilities. There's transition effects. So the fact that the effect isn't exactly zero is not, to, not necessarily an indication that anything is wrong. But an effect this large, I think, really does cry out for an explanation. And so uh, I guess the implication I draw here for dynamic scoring and dynamic analysis is the need for greater transparency to really break down what was the change in the effective marginal tax rate. And I realize it would have to be done for different types of households and different income levels and showing the effect of the statutory rate change and then how the, the base broadening marginal effects, how much of that was taken back um, in, from, from that channel. Um, so those are the two main features of the uh, CAMP estimate. Let me just close with a few seconds uh, mentioning something that uh, Nick actually touched on. I do think that Section 8C1 of the new rule is really important, where it calls for qualitative analysis going out an extra 20 years. I do think it's a mistake if we start obsessing too much about trying to nail down these macroeconomic effects within the 10-year window and ignore what is really important about the long run. And I know that the long run is harder to estimate, and that's why the rule says go out only 20 years beyond the 10, and why it says to do it in qualitative terms instead of quantitative terms. But I think that's actually an overlooked part of the uh, rule that actually uh, may be in, in ultimately as important as uh, the rest of the rule. Thank you. Hi, I'm Chai Ching from the Centre on Budget. So we're getting these dynamic scores in the house, and I think the question is going to be, how do we avoid misinterpreting them? And I think that if a dynamic score of a policy looks better than a traditional score in some way, that the, the temptation is going to be to say simply that that means the policy must be good for the economy. But the heroic assumptions, uncertainty, and large gaps in the model I think means that we have to treat the dynamic scores with much more caution than that when we interpret them. And the CAMP plan has some lessons on that. So if you were to go by Chairman CAMP's media releases, his tax plan had a really big growth impact that would have led to 700 billion in extra revenues over a decade. But of course, that was just the high end of JCT's range of estimates, and the low end of the range was a much more modest 50 billion. And the 700 billion came from one run of this OLG model that's been mentioned. And to get that 700 billion, JCT had to pretend that there would be large tax increases and transfer cuts baked into the baseline. So those are things that are in addition to the camp plan itself. And that's because, as you've heard, OLG simply doesn't work if you don't assume that lawmakers enact additional deficit reduction to stabilize debt as a share of GDP over the long run. So that much touted 700 billion number didn't really tell us much about the growth effects of the camp plan in any world that we really know or might even predict. So when we get a single dynamic score, it's going to be incredibly important to understand whether and how the OLG model, for example, contributes to that score and the predictions about future congressional lawmaking that are driving that result. Now, the House rule requires a single point estimate, and to make any sense of that score at all, it's going to be really critical to know the outputs from the different models and the assumptions that went into those models to produce that single score. And in addition, I think, just echoing what some of my other panelists have said, that's going to be crucial for JCT to show us results from a range of models and assumptions in addition to the score so that we can understand how that score is sensitive to different assumptions and models. So for example, if OLG does end up being used, it's going to be really important to understand what would happen if you made different assumptions about how future lawmakers um, deal with deficits and when they deal with deficits. 
Another pitfall that the camp analysis highlights in interpreting dynamic estimates is that we need to know not just how tax reform affects the budget and the economy, we also need to understand how it affects people at different parts of the income distribution. JCT's distributional analysis of the plan showed that there were showed effective tax rates faced by people at different parts of the income scale, both before and after the plan. And Camp relied on those tables to support his claim that the plan was distributionally neutral. But unlike the 700 billion in revenues from the growth estimates that he cited, those distributional tables didn't bake in future deficit reduction from future Congresses. So if you had put that deficit reduction into those distribution tables, they would have looked very different. So when we get a dynamic score and a distributional estimate, it's going to be pretty important to understand whether or not they show the very same post-reform set of policies. I think a final pot potential pitfall in interpreting these scores is you know, the current estimates, the current models have some pretty big gaps, and JCT can do some things off model to try and deal with them, but for example, there's no explicit modeling of human capital. If you had a plan that really boosted incentives to invest in skills and training, the higher productivity from increased human capital accumulation wouldn't necessarily show up in the score from the base models. So that's despite the evidence that doing, doing such investment is associated with productivity, growth, and increased investment. Likewise, there's a bunch of sectors that aren't currently explicitly modeled. We might want to talk about that a little bit more on the panel. And again, JCT is doing the very best with the very best models that it has available, has available but um, we have to watch out for that, particularly if reform affects particular sectors. So while lawmakers uh, some lawmakers will simply want to treat a dynamic score as proof that something is good or bad for the economy and the people in it. I think we have to keep in mind the uncertainty, the flaws, the heroic assumptions that go into these models, and they, those, those things may mean that that conclusion is simply not sound. Uh, okay, while we're getting uh, set up, let me uh, thank the speakers uh, again and uh, just say that uh, you all normally or frequently the moderator starts a discussion among the panelists, but uh, you all have been very patient and I know there are a lot of questions out there, so we're going to turn directly to questions. Exercise my, moderate, my moderate, moderator prerogatives as we move along. Uh, so, question, Marty Sullivan. And I too want to commend Brookings Tax Policy Center for having this excellent conference on this timely topic. And I want to thank JCT for coming out and being so open about what's inside the black box, giving us a view under the hood. Uh, I want to reiterate a point that Jane brought up because perhaps not as much as Jane, I have been studying these uh, results and I cannot figure out what is going on. So I'm gonna take advantage of this opportunity to ask JCT about the multinational sector. Uh, if I have it correct, in their analysis of the camp proposal, intellectual property migrates, uh, because um, we lower the tax on the United States on intellectual property and raise the tax on the foreign side, intellectual property uh, migrates back to the United States. And as I understand it in the model, this increases uh, productivity and economic growth in the United States. Is that is that right, Pam? Okay. Let's have, let's have Pam or Nick address it. I just want to put, you can just spin the mic open for you. Uh, uh, just put this in the context of the issues we've been discussing is in elasticity that uh, we really don't have great evidence on, uh, but that nonetheless is critical to the growth effects. So let me just put it into terms I think everybody can understand. If you have a multinational which, is, uh, which has domestic production, domestic factory, and a foreign factory, I think what the model is saying is 
because of the tax changes in the camp plan, some of the know-how, for example, one type of intellectual property is know-how or expertise. That expertise is going to move from the foreign location uh, and redu reduce output there and then come into the United States and increase output here just because of a legal recharacterization of, of where this property is located. And I find this totally unrealistic, but I could be missing something, so I just want to ask for some clarification. So, uh, so I think one um, thing that could have been improved in our report was describing what we meant by IP a little better, because it isn't just intellectual property, it's really intangible property. And um, the, mod, the multinational corporation sector with that shifting is based on the paper that was cited earlier. And yes, that it does have that effect. Uh, we are, as we mentioned, always trying to look for uh, whether or not models need to be altered, and we are researching right now what we think should be done about that. Uh, yes. Just to keep the tax analyst streak going, I'm Luke Toncelli. I am a Capitol Hill reporter for Tax Notes. Um, this is also for Nick and Pam, um, and I'm not sure if this question is too vague, too complicated, or something you already covered, but how um, do you think about the issue of crowding out? Because obviously the way that a tax cut is financed can affect its economic impact. And um, I think I've, I've found so far in the tax, being in the tax world that that's a big factor that people kind of dance around or don't fully acknowledge when they're talking about how they view the economic effects of tax cuts. So. Okay, so... Um particularly in the MEG model where we don't have to make any kind of closing assumption. Whatever crowding out is happening because of the proposal is going to have the normal sort of effects that crowding out has. It drives up interest rates and is therefore going to depress capital formation as you move out down the horizon. Um, for OLG, we try to make the, we, there are two things. First of all, the closing assumption, because we are trying to model tax policy, we try not to use a counterfactual change to tax policy to make the closing assumption. Second of all, so what we have been doing is, is looking at transfers, but another possibility is to change government spending. And so we'll, you know, that's something that can be reviewed as to exactly how to split that up. But um, the second thing that we do is the closing assumptions, we, we try to make those happen after the end of the budget horizon. Now, that means that crowding out can happen inside the horizon and have its normal crowding out effects. But because OLG is forward looking, people do anticipate, for instance, either that there is a um, change in transfers after the end of the horizon or a change in spending, whichever one you're using. And that can have inside the horizon effects because of anticipa anticipation. So this is a question to the panelists or, 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 or the two of you from JCT, kind of a bottom line question, which is, so given what we've learned over the last 30 minutes, which has been very helpful and very, as I've already said, under the hood in ways that I think most of us are nearly as ensconced as maybe we might be, um, do you think that the accuracy of the budget process is legitimately enhanced, improved by a rule that um, forces estimators, and I would argue nudged by partisans, to make one choice, to choose one. I mean, in other words, dynamic analysis, yeah, that's different than dynamic scoring. And I guess just my sense sitting here is um, I'd like to hear your views on whether this force, whether the fact that we're, we're talking about choosing one score, given what we've just heard, would actually improve the accuracy of our process. Let's have our panel uh, address it. Want me to start? Okay. I am actually on the record as saying uh, that I don't think we're ready for dynamic scoring uh, when I testify before the Budget Committee because of the variation that we have seen here and all of the, the moving parts. For, I think it's certainly possible that the camp proposal had a zero effect on growth or possibly a negative effect depending on how these sort of things that I find questionable. If you've got an estimate for one one estimate is 16 times the other, or 15 times the other. I mean, I don't know what kind of answer you have there. And, and I think when you go back to 
for many things, uh, going back to what Doug, Doug was saying, I think for many things, the static scoring is very clear. I mean, if you're going to do rate cuts, you have a very clear set of data for doing a lot of these things. But until we can get some kind of consensus about uh, macro effects, you know, we're kind of forcing these guys to do, or Pam and, and Nick is, is a guy, um, <laughs> to, uh, sorry, if I was still in the South, I'd say y'all, but I try to get over saying that, uh, that, you know, you're kind of forcing them to do something that's almost impossible to do. I mean, uh, so that's how I see it. Cool. So it is an excellent question. I think it is a judgment call because we've certainly seen how difficult and how uncertain this process is. And I think this has certainly increased our respect for the people who do this, uh, who have been doing the dynamic analysis. And, uh, I uh, realize we're putting another layer on them if we go with the dynamic scoring. But I do think it's important to keep in mind just how absolutely modest this rule change is. And I just have to think at this stage in the process, after all the years of doing dynamic analysis, that it should be useful to be doing one or two dynamic scores a year uh, for the next Congress, the next two years, and see how that process plays out and improve that. Uh, we ultimately do want to get to a point where we are taking these effects into account, and this seems like a very modest step towards doing that. Maybe what's worth stressing is just that there really is a consensus here on a lot of things. I think we all agree that we want to take these effects into account if we can. We all agree that it's difficult to, uh, to do it uh, right. Uh, but uh, we also agree that the overwhelming majority of bills that we should not yet try to do this for. And so the only issue of dispute is, should we be trying to do this for one or two a year? And although I think it is possible to, for people of goodwill certainly to disagree on this, you know, my view is, yeah, let, let's give that a try. Let's start trying to bring those effects in for one or two big bills a year. So, so the problem, I think, with, with that response is that the House rule allows the chairman of the committees to essentially designate any bill, a bill that, to which a dynamic score must be produced. So this 0.25% rule that we've been focusing on a lot so far can just be blown away by the chairs of the budget committees. Um, alternatively, if they don't want something to be dynamically scored, they think it might not give a favorable result, just split up the bills, not report it out of committee. So I, I think, I mean, I agree with Jane on the substance, and I think I disagree on the fact that the process is gonna protect protect JCT in the sense that there's only going to be two or three bills a year. This is essentially at the discretion of the chairs of the committees. Yeah, I just want to add, I think the process issues, the political economy issues is really important. But I think it's also important to note that when we do a, quote, static score, unquote, we are really doing a static analysis. We're averaging the effects of a bunch of static scores. So without so, opining at all on the substance of what everyone has just said, just a little sort of clarifying comment is that we anticipate that for something like camp, you'd still have exactly the same 15 pages that were already published, but now there will be an extra line at the bottom that just has a, a dynamic score. And can, while you've got the mic, can, can, and, and can you clarify I should say I'm not speaking on behalf of joint committee. Yeah, yeah. It's just my uh, comment. Can you clarify whether it's net or gross? In the first discussion, we thought it was a gross tax change of 25. We understand that it should be gross, so. The net. Yeah. The just, slide did say net, but yeah, the text of the bill says gross. And it's not the title the gross. gross budgetary effects means, but the <laughs> bill does say gross. So. All right, so we know what it says, but we don't know what it means. <laughs> I don't, at least I don't know what it means exactly. Adele. Hi, I'm Adele Morris. I'm the Policy Director for Climate and Energy Economics Project here at Brookings. My question is about the scoring of a bill that's got a lot of complicated elements in it that are not simply just fiscal policy or tax policy. So for example, let's suppose we had a bill that imposed an excise tax on carbon content of fossil fuels, for example, and some of that revenue it buys down business tax rates, for example. So you've got the kind of question of how you're going to dynamically score a tax swap, maybe with additional elements in there. But then what if also there's a regulatory reform in there that says we're going we're gonna to suspend Clean Air Act regulations on stationary sources? How do, how do you or do you deal with that? And also in that context, would there be a change in how CBO would score an excise tax because they have that standard 25% haircut on the gross 
revenues of excise taxes? Would the d dynamic score change that? All right, let's, so, let's get an answer to that. Does anyone want to? I would hate to be confronted with that issue, but excise taxes do have allocational effects in labor. I mean, a, an excise tax is like a labor tax, so I would treat it as a labor tax and also changing the allocation. I'm cl I would be clueless. I mean, I would be sorry for whoever had to do that, but I'm not sure they'd have to do that. That's essentially a change in the baseline. Perspective, I think. Uh, Eric. Thank you, I'm Eric Toder. I had a question about how these results get presented. I just heard Nick said, say that to close the model on the camp proposal, they cut transfer payments. So what we had in the dynamic score was not an estimate of the camp proposal. We had an estimate of the camp proposal plus a cut, say, in Social Security benefits. And that would play out very differently in the public mind if that were the way it were were presented. I mean, I'm not questioning the accuracy of the estimate in this comment. So I guess my question is, should um, people, since models require some closing assumption, should members, in order to get a dynamic score, be required to specify the closing assumption they would like used? A simple yes, can, no question. Thank you. Can I, can I correct the record for just a second? So. Um, there's a, that's a kind of common misconception on, on the camp proposal in particular. Uh, it is true we have to have a standard closing assumption to, for the so-called present law baseline in order to get a present law baseline from camp. And, um, in, and what is in there, and, and I will concede we probably need to re-examine how important we think that might have been to the estimate, but what is in there is kind of, is a, you know, some of all of the above approach where we, the economy, present law economy, uh, is kept on track where debt does not grow faster than GDP by a combination of, of increased taxes and reduced um, transfer payments. Now that is separate from how did we analyze the proposed camp reform. So one thing you want to remember about the proposed camp reform, it was explicitly designed to be budget neutral. That um, after all of the base broadening and all the tax rate changes were accounted for, there would be close to, there would be zero effect on the deficit. And in fact, if you look at our 15 page conventional revenue table, it's really close. All right, so, so, so one, let me, one fi can, let me one finish. Can imagine, one can imagine a different proposal that's not revenue neutral. So well, can Eric's I just question. can I just finish yes, okay. this part? Um, so there, but if it's under conventional analysis, deficit neutral, and there's something that causes growth, then you might have the reverse situation where you would have surpluses growing faster than GDP, which is also not fiscally stable, and so you would have to make an assumption that uh, that pulled down. Uh, that. Now, for the CAMP proposal, and this is all in our analysis, so this tells me people are looking at the tables and not reading the verbiage, because the verbiage explained what the closing assumption was in the baseline, and it also explained what the closing assumption was uh, in the proposal. Um, we had to assume a slight increase in transfer payments in the future to make up for the growth that was being generated. All right, thank you. Okay. This question is not about the camp proposal. I think the question is, should, a, should if someone proposes something that's not revenue neutral or budget neutral, should they have to propose either a closing mechanism, a way to raise the revenue? That's, that's, that's how I interpret Eric's question. So yes, no, short so, explanation. Well, yes. <laughs> yes, or either, okay. or either give up the OLG model, because if you do if you have a tax cut and you do uh, the correction with transfers, that's going to be a very different outcome of a correction for government spending and sort of an even bigger effect of a tax, you know, tax cut is if you assume taxes are going to rise in the future, then you have an intertemporal, huge intertemporal labor supply response. I think they chose a fairly benign change, although if it had been me, I would have changed government. Okay, let's, again, let's make this a general answer, not a camp. Yeah, yeah this is a general answer. I think that if the member specifies it, in the le if it's actually written into the bill, then of course that's what uh, should be done. I think if it's not in the bill, then as Doug said earlier, there should be a standard assumption. It should be an all of the above thing. I think that's the right approach, exactly. And, uh, and that should apply to everything. And I think it also, that effect should be incorporated as well in considering the distributional effects of the bill. 
Uh, uh, the problem with that, though, is that you're then assuming things that policymakers will do things that they have not said that they will do. But they'll and have JCT to do and something. CDO but avoid that assumption. You know, but you can't. But you can't cost. avoid it because budgetary, you know, reality requires that they do something they haven't said they're going to do. You know, they haven't said right. that they're going to fix the fiscal situation, but they're going to have to. But then so the think, congressman says, "Well, my proposal would raise growth," and someone says, "Well, that's because you're cutting." you know, food stamps, and the congressman said, oh, I never proposed food stamp cuts, I have just proposed tax cuts. So it allows congressmen to, or senators or, to talk out of both sides of their mouth. Well, I think, you, I, I think what you need to do, I, I think you, That's I think, new. I think you need to make yeah, very prominent the, what the standard assumption involves, and that should be part of the analysis. And if the member says, that's not what I want, then the, que the response should be, why didn't you put in the bill what it is you do want? I do want to highlight the standard assumption can flip the sign of the growth effects, as Len was saying earlier. If you have a tax cut and you finance it by future tax rate increases, you'll get a negative impact on long-term growth. If you finance it with future you know, uh, welfare spending cuts, you'll get a, maybe a positive impact on economic growth. Well, so, just one so more I, thing about this, and, and then I won't say anything else, is I think the most benign assumption for a tax change is a change in government spending, because at least that allows the income and substitution effects for labor to sort of play out in full. So you could just say, let's try to choose what's going to least disturb our analysis directly. I think going back to what I was saying earlier, whatever goes into the single point estimate, however you choose it, if you make the congressperson say what it's going to be, or you leave it up to JCT, whatever it is, I'd really love to see the sensitivity analysis of if you chose different assumptions in the baseline and the offsetting policy, what would happen? Okay, one last question in the back. Hi, my name is Ricky. I'm the fiscal policy intern at the American Action Forum under Doug and also a current student at the UG, uh, University of Georgia. So it's awesome to meet Dr. Gravel up there. Uh, my question is that a lot of this seems to be all or nothing. Either it's dynamic scoring or it's nothing. And would it make the panel more comfortable if we kept dynamic scoring and also had the static scoring in there so you can use it and see almost where the margin of error or the differences since dynamic scoring is going to provide uh, a larger estimate? Very short answers. Yes, but I think Pam said that's their plan. Yeah, the conventional score clearly should be disclosed. I mean, and I assume it will be. Uh, you know, and again, it's not really all or nothing because we are talking about on a small number of bills. I mean, my, it is my hope that the budget chairman do not abuse the discretion that the rule, I, in, mistakenly in my view, gives them. Um, Last word. All right, thank you. I want to thank all the panelists. I want to thank in particular Nick and Pam. And thank you all for